Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the BPD uh, live show here with Sensitive Stability. I am Kevin Reynolds. For those of you who do not know me, I am a BPD survivor uh, and I, I currently coach for BPD. So our live show at night is a little different than the day. Sometimes we mix it up, have a little bit of, um, you know, different stuff going on to make it a little exciting. Uh, today, we're going to have David on. David is a sensitive stability coach. He specializes in trauma and leads our trauma branch. Uh, and he's a great friend of mine. And also, you may know him as the moderator from the morning. I'm going to go ahead and invite you on, David, and we can get rolling. <sighs> also point out that that is 7 a.m. U.S. EST. So you can catch us in the morning, 7 a.m. U.S. EST. How you doing, David? Hey, buddy. Good. How are you? Doing good. Good. I have to adjust my headphones, so sure. Yeah. Bear yeah. with. You want me to keep talking? No. Yeah. Look, can you hear me? Yep. Sure. Okay. Can. Perfect. I'm always afraid I'm going to hit mute. Never fails. I'm on a phone call. My mouth is running. My earbud gets loose. I touch it, and it mutes it. And I oh, yeah, I do that, too. And I keep talking. Mm -hmm. So how's, uh, forgive me, everybody, but how's the background sound? I know sometimes we have issues with that. I don't hear it. I, I can hear it when it happens. No, we got, I, I fixed the problem for us. Remember, I, I keep mine very low. It turns out that, you know, my cats kept destroying the really expensive <laughs> AirPod Pros. Like I was telling you, I got sick of buying them over and over again. So I started buying the second gen ones because they work pretty good for me and i have no complaints but they expel lots of sound so mm. the feedback you know away. good well, well then the i will ask going forward if there's a problem you all will let us know i have just been a little nervous about it because it seemed like every time i logged on it was like oh, i got it. love got david's away. tan but i hate the noise that comes with it <laughs> yeah for sure man but we got it so special show tonight. You want to yeah. you want to take it from here, or are you ready to go? Yeah, I will. So first, I want to say that we see AJ and Laura and Liz and all you amazing people in the comments. I have a few questions that I want to ask Kevin, and so we may not be paying much attention to the comments. Don't take offense to that. If it's something important, send it to us after our little. Here that I planned, we'll do our best to adjust. So either way, we see, we hear, we love you, and thank you. Um, but don't take offense if it takes us a minute to respond. So what I have noticed, Kevin, in the lives recently is the word trauma is being used a lot. Yep. And so I wanted to what what does trauma mean to you? Personally, we're, we're speaking personally, I'm guessing, not uh, from a clinical perspective. Trauma, or both, if you want. That's fine, okay. too. Um, if I had to define trauma, I, I would say um, it is a defined time or period of time. We'll just use the word moment for any ex you know, period of time, right? Of which is stored in the brain more vividly from a negative perspective and of which has left um, an individual damaged in some way. Uh, I would look at the idea of memory as emotion, emotional content, which is all memory is. It's emotion. So that's why we often remember really, really good times and really, really bad times more vividly. So that, that, that would be how I'd answer it in terms of definition, but up. Uh, Personally, trauma to me is, it was a perspective change, is what it was, because it was a bit more of it. It was an adjustment to the entire rest of my life. My life changed when I experienced trauma. It changed significantly, the entire future. It's like um, the butterfly effect, if you've ever seen that movie, something terrible happens and the entire future then changes okay so that's um 
that's what it is to me. I look at it and instantly um, recognize the points in my life where things changed dramatically about how I looked at the world. The very first time I experienced trauma, for instance, um, that was the first time I recognized that there was uh, danger, that there was danger in the world. So that's kind of what it means. Anyway. Yeah, no, I love that. So I said I have three questions, and we answered one, and now I have three more. <laughs> okay. No, that's so, perfect, because that's the way it goes. One more it? added, too. But one of the words that you used that I personally like, but would love for you to talk about when I hear the word damaged, I think it's fixable, right? I I I hit a mailbox, knocked off the rear view mirror, or yeah, you no, know, rear that's view mirror inside of the it's car. Okay. Everybody it's, knows what you mean. I, I knocked off the mirror. <laughs> I do the best I can, Laura, with car talk. I do the best I can. I was hoping to make you proud, and I failed. But next time, <laughs> the car is damaged, right? But then you use the resources to fix that damage to where it's new again and no one knows the difference so when you use the word damage that's what i take from it but i don't want to speak for you so when you said damage can you yeah i can elaborate um so damaged does mean fixing um is possible damage is not permanently broken um and and that is I've always found that to be the case personally and, and when I'm helping people or working with people and coaching sessions or whatnot, even some of the most, um, even some of the most damaging circumstances can still be corrected because we're talking about modifications to the brain. That's really what it is. But get too deep into the science of it. Uh, it is possible to change the brain at any point in your life. It is possible to correct any type of trauma. It is possible to um, redirect the energy that you have spent re-experiencing trauma. And it is possible to fully recover from it, in my opinion. Um, just, I use that word for, for a reason. It wasn't necessarily for the reason that you highlighted. You highlighted it for the reason of, hey, that means it's fixable, right? Which you're absolutely darn right it is. Um, the reason I, I use the word damaged is because um, it affects the integrity of our ability to properly represent ourselves in the world. And, and, that word. and other people can see it when you hear people say they're damaged, you know, well, they very well may be, you know, you could see damage most of the time. It, it has a, not just a, a physiological effect on us to re-experience trauma. It not only has an effect on our life's path, but it affects what we put out into the world. You know, consequently, unfortunately, what we get back from the world, which, which is the worst part because right when you start out as a victim, in the situation, and then you're struggling for that self-confidence. You're struggling for that sense of self, and you can only put so much out in the world. Doesn't it kind of suck that you get very little back? And it's all because you experience something that largely, in every case, in fact, wasn't chosen, wasn't your choice. That's a terrible thing. It's very similar to borderline personality disorder and how that forms based in trauma. Oh. deep so deep but but these are the conversations we have to yeah. have we have to, we have to talk about the hard things that, and I love it. So, yeah i love it too so, i mean so i love diving you. in all these topics so yeah. you know feel free to ask away no question by the way is off limits that's totally fine and I that's, also that's what I love out. about you like even on a personal level like there have been times that i've called kevin um to the listeners, like there's been times I've called Kevin with me even being new to the BBD, uh, BPD. And, and I've called Kevin and said, I don't know what this means. And he knew my heart, he knew my intention. It was all just me trying to educate myself. And I take, if you all seen 
my desk. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I take I take this stuff very seriously and and so anyway, that's a whole different tangent. But another question that I have when it comes to I found in my journey through healing, my journey, my personal journey through remission, uh, that is not BPD related, but right. still related you know, a recovery of related. absolutely it's the same ballpark. Absolutely. And then and now um even some of the people that I've talked with, the word remission it's stigmatized with doctors and medication and some kind of some kind of something right and sure. so i'm learning that that is not and i mean this was a lesson that i had to learn for myself uh even before you and i met that what is the true definition of my question to you is kind of a two-parter is what is remission to you and what role does or did trauma play into your remission yeah okay that that's a great question um firstly everybody who has borderline personality disorder has experienced some type of trauma that's i've never met someone who has it. it's a matter of understanding how the trauma fits into a resistance factor in my opinion so when i start out coaching someone for bpd i'm not asking them tons of questions about their trauma for a reason it's because right now the most pressing matters are what behavior is being displayed and and what's the what's the most behavior that needs to be resolved as we start diving into those most critical behaviors the trauma naturally comes to the surface because it's always at the root to some extent you just don't realize it yet, but there's no need to unpack that directly right away when you're doing a BPD remission program, for instance. Remission, clinically speaking, from BPD means that you have less than five of the nine symptoms. I have always looked at that as a very um, low ambition goal uh, because, you know, in my head, if you can solve one problem, you can solve another problem. You can solve any problem. I mean, any problem can be resolved. You just have to have the tools, the perspective, and then the will to change to get there. So I, I focus on getting no symptoms, getting, getting people to no symptoms, which is what I experience. I consider that true remission um, far beyond the clinical definition of it, and it is 100% possible to do that. Now, during the journey to getting to remission, there are stages. When we hit those stages where I could tell that the trauma is now on the surface. In in many cases, um, it is faster, and this is why we, for me to send that person to you at that point to resolve that part that has surfaced. It takes one one or two sessions usually, and that middle part. Normally, I approach this about seventy five percent of the way. When I decide that you are about seventy five percent of the way through remission, and I could tell, I could tell exactly where everyone is in the journey because I have been there before. That's when I'm like, okay, so now we're no longer talking about, you know, um, who didn't do the dishes, as I always say, you know, this silly thing, you know, we break that down. It's really a disrespect thing. We break each thing down. But once you get through some of the surface stuff and life's getting a little better, now you have to think about why life isn't getting great. And the trauma is the reason that it isn't getting great. Skills can get you a little resolving the trauma and achieving validation, which largely with BPD go hand in hand. In order to achieve the validation, you also have to get over the trauma. And when I say get over it, I don't mean like get over it, man. Nobody cares. I mean, you specifically have to care, in fact, to get over it. That part's, that part's just as critical as me caring about the client along you know so that's a tough one for bpd when you're using a you know you, you mentioned medicines doctors other you know these other therapy models out there and therapy in general it's very difficult for us as bpd people to get to that stage which is why oftentimes therapy and such doesn't work and why is that it's because there's no trust factor for one 
we're worried about getting reported. The difference with me is I'm a mandated reporter. You know, I believe that people need a place to go. You had said, David, at one point, uh, and I think this is relevant here, so it's it's a slight segue, but I think it's I can pack it in here. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'll, I think I might have gotten enough in, in this question, right? But um, you had asked me when we decided to combine forces and kind of combine our operations, you know, you're surviving test and, you know, sensitive stability. We're going to do it, okay? You said, do you have the clients sign contracts? And my answer was no, I don't, okay? I used to, but I don't anymore. I made this decision very recently, you know, and it's because I decided that that doesn't matter. Um, They're coming to me in confidence, like they can't tell anyone on the face of the planet. And if there's something like that, it lowers my, my trust factor, my credibility. I trust the client. The client trusts me. I'll tell them anything about me. It's an experience based service. You know, it's, it's, it's human to human. It's heartfelt. It's putting passion into what you do. Um, and if, if your job is to stack boxes all day, then you should pick each box up with the best possible care and lay it down better than that box has ever been laid in its life, better than any box has ever been laid. And if you function that way, um, like which I do with my clients, you know, there's really nothing to be afraid of. There is no liability. People need a friend through this. There's nothing wrong with that. Not, not anything wrong with that whatsoever. So I think that that's important at the trauma phase because that's where you're starting to talk about the causes, the things you've buried really deep. For those to come out, you got to really trust somebody, man. I mean, you really got to trust somebody. I think that kind of um, – I think I hit all the nails on that one. I'm not no, sure. No, yeah. Yeah, okay, no, I might that was it. brilliant. It was a two-part question. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, nope. It was great. It was brilliant. Two-part question, I... a answer response. <laughs> Look, we do the best we can, right? Um, so, <clears throat> I will say in response, one of the reasons I asked you about the contract question, and one of the reasons you know that I wanted to work with you is because of your answer to the contract questions. I had some I had a, a company approach me that offered me a, a nice salary that um would have been life changing for me at the time. That doesn't mean millions of dollars, but it would have been it, it was an advancement of where I was, thing. right? A good thing, yeah. And but they said we have to have contracts. If someone contacts you and says i don't want my episode released too bad you've already done it um we've already recorded and i turned yeah i remember you telling me that i turned that down yeah Mm -hmm. i was like i'm not doing that i will only be part of the healing and not the trauma i get so excited when people because it's happened and it happens on a regular basis now that i'm getting years under my belt but i remember the first time that someone messaged me and said it's the year anniversary of the a podcast with you. And wow, it's the that's first awesome. time of me sharing my story on a public platform, and I listen to it daily. Yeah, you know, know like right? they're so proud of it. I so so I mean, I turned down a great financial opportunity, right? But it was against my morals and my values. Yeah. So I was like. I can't put a dollar sign on that and I'm not doing it. And and that is what, when I asked that question and it was like, okay, this is it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do not need you to sign a contract to tell me that you are going to be proactive in changing your life. I'm not the one changing your life. I'm just a resource and a stepping stone to help you find the ways to change your life. Right on. I don't need a contract to tell me that you're doing that. If you decide not to do it after we made an agreement, then you know yep, I fully I, and, agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was when when I heard that answer, when it was just me and you in a in a business yeah. conversation, I was like, okay, 
this this is this is who I've been looking for. Yeah, I so agree. yeah. So the third question, and I want to say last, but we all know me at this point. There'll probably be more, but, <laughs> but at this time, the third is what is your relationship to trauma now that you are remissioned or in mm. remission? Mm. Um, my initial response, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to streamline this one because, uh, I think I'm, I think it's important to hear this part of it. My initial response was favorable with trauma is very friendly now. And, and that's a weird thing to say. Uh, but I have developed the ability to go back and look at my trauma without re-experiencing the emotions of it, to use it as a tool at first that was to better my life. But then I realized that I could do this and better other people's lives. So I often talk about how when I'm helping someone through some, an episode, a split, a piece of trauma that I am able to resolve, something I don't have to send them to you for, I go back in time when I do that. I, I go back and that's when I let myself re-experience it, the emotion of it. And I feel the pain of it. And then I can relate to that person. And I know where they're coming from. I know what they're feeling. I know how hard it is. I know what I did. I remember, right? I, I say that I have a friendly relationship with trauma now because I have to use it as an ally in order to understand how to resolve a client's issues. So for me, it's developed into this whole new thing. And, and this is a coach-based answer. I can give you the personal-based answer as well. But this is a tool that I use. Now, if I don't re-experience it, I, I'm too distant. I can't, I can't properly be feeling. I can't properly care the way that you need me to care. But I go back in time and say, I remember what it was like to not be understood. I remember what it was like to not, you know, be cared for, to not be seen, to not be heard. I remember the judgment. I remember the, you know, stigma surrounding my trauma, for instance. It's embarrassing. I'm going back in time. It's not embarrassing now. It's it was embarrassing. And and that's how a lot of people feel. And it and it's very tough about things that you are embarrassed about, for instance. You notice a lot of the times I talk about how you need to remove embarrassment, guilt, blame, and shame from the equation in order to actually grow and get better. If you don't, it's going to just hold you back. All it is is a giant anchor on your ship, so to speak. So you got to cut all four of the fingers off, let them go, and now you're, now you're picking up. Now the wind can move you forward into the next stage of your life. Um, but it does take learning certain skills, like objective analysis, being able to look at the past without experiencing any emotion. How do you do that? Well, you, you list emotion as a fact. I remember that. I was feeling really ashamed. I remember feeling rejected, worthless. That That's how I felt, right? But you don't have to feel that way now. You have to Make sure the amygdala understands that you are analyzing a story, even though it's your own story. You're not going back in time to feel what you had. You can do that. You can control the amygdala in that sense with the right practice. That's what I mean when I say my initial response was I have a friendly, favorable relationship with trauma. Now, personally speaking, um, coach aside, just saying as Kevin Reynolds, this is what I think, you know, I think trauma is uh, a growth point and I understand that it was undesirable. I understand that it wasn't, um, something that we asked for. I understand that it was not something we wanted. I understand that it was a traumatic experience, but that does not change the fact that growth comes from pain and suffering. I look at the trauma, not just at the event. I look at how long it takes to get through it and boom, you get through it there at 38 years old or whatever. Your trauma was from six to 38. That's the trauma. And now you 
So it, it's opening a door to a better period. Um, and, and it's how you take that trauma and, and manipulate it into an energy that does something good in the world and put it out there um, that matters more than anything at all. You know, you've probably heard me say a million and one times, everybody's probably heard me say, it's not your fault, if it's not like, but it's damn. I'm sure your responsibility to do something about the life, to build something, you know, that you want to live in, that's your responsibility. You can't blame your father forever and then expect to live the life you want to live. So I spent way too long blaming my parents for things. And if not them, the rest of the world. I mean, I favor to point at every single thing and person around me except for maybe it's my turn to be responsible here. I should stand up and take some responsibility for the life I want to, I want to build, not for the trauma, but I, and every day that goes forward where I don't do that, that experience that was way out of my control an external environment hit me like a hurricane the rest of my life. It's owning me. It will affect my relationships. It will affect my job. It will affect my self-exploration, happiness, any type of satisfaction or purpose. Forget about it. That's not even possible to the fullest extent. You can't manifest the greatest version of yourself if you cannot evolve. It's just a basic mathematical formula. So that's why it's so important to get over it. And I guess the last thing I'll say about that is it's an obstacle. It also is an obstacle because it is something that you must get over in a sense. I hate saying it like that, but you have to evolve. And it's in the way of you becoming that down that you know you're supposed to be. We all know who that is. You remember back when you were a kid, they told you you could do anything. You'd be an astronaut, rocket scientist, multimillionaire, president of the United States, whatever you dream, you can do it. Somewhere along the line, they kill that somehow. They being the environment around us doesn't treat us well. Yeah. Nails us to the ground and then nope, we can't do this. And then we're stuck in it, believing it. But if you can see it, you know, if you could see it clearly and you could put it into the world, then it can happen. So that is um that is what I think about about trauma in a nutshell. It's a really well, big nutshell. I love it, and and I'm glad that we had this time discussing that. Trauma gets brought up a lot in our lives, and yes, we indeed. touch on them. We touch on it, you know. But I, but today I was saying I was like, you know, we need to dive deep in this with with Kevin because, <clears throat> excuse me, so many people are seeing you and relating to you and. And so I just thought tonight would be a great opportunity. And to be honest with you, the questions that I asked you tonight are not questions that I knew the full answers to. So they were, well, you know, I'm happy a, a curiosity to, for myself as well. So thank you for that. Provide. Yeah, no problem. My response to that, um, to to the last answer that you made, last question. <laughs> is I always try to tell people that the way that I look at my situation, what happened to me and, and my trauma, I'm not going to rehash it right now, but I'm always willing to if there's questions. But I think of it as I, I did not wish or choose the path I was on, but I woke up one day behind the wheel of a car, right? And it's, I'm on this road. I'm the driver of this car. So now I get to choose how the car is driven. I get to choose how to get through this path I've now been put on. Kind of like when you're driving a car and you take the wrong turn, you're like, WTF, what just happened? Yeah. You know, you have to kind of just, reel it in and and be the driver and so so that's what has been a nice tool for myself 
and my recovery is, okay, I didn't pick this car, I didn't pick this road, but I'm behind the wheel, <laughs> you know? And so, so I always try to think of things in that perspective and it, and it helps. Um, but moving forward, we've had some great things come in and I'm going to scroll to the top, but there's a few things. So be patient and things are a little bit out of order, but, um, I did see where AJ asked me if I have watched your modules and the short answer AJ is absolutely. That was one of the first things I did when Kevin and I connected and wanted to discuss business ventures together. So absolutely. I've watched them. I love them. There will be questions or topics that I bring up that maybe I do know the answer to that's part of the module, but I'm doing it because I want, to ask the questions that maybe a listener is thinking, um, but hasn't asked. Um, but yes, I have watched the modules and I'm not late for Kevin to autograph my t-shirt because I'm a fan. <laughs> like, like mm. I, I'm a fan of this man and he's one of my best friends. Like how great is my life? So there's that. <laughs> um, there was something else that I saw that was really cool. It looked like, Miss Liss and Laura was one of the boys who asked the question, and I can't find it, but something about our, do we take people on and help people? And they were saying, yes, go to Linktree, oh, yeah. all the things are in there, contact them. Um, yes, definitely do that. Like, we, we want to help people, that's why we do this. Um, and ah, much better. I might look a little just, yellow, like scurvy. Sorry about that, but I couldn't take that bright white light in my eyes anymore. I had to shut that off. So it is what it is. Actually, you, I'll fix it. You keep talking, David. I was going to say, you always look amazing and it pisses me off because I have yeah, one, right, two, man. three, four, five lights on me, a spray tan and Botox, and I'm still like, what scary movie am I watching? But I have a kind heart. <laughs> yeah you're you're pretty great and uh you you're always keeping it together you know it's it's Ugh. it's i i'm always falling behind but it's only because i i work a lot and i i can't keep up with some stuff you know you're better at some stuff than me you're a better note taker you know you're a better uh tanner <laughs> like you got, you got a lot of you got a lot of stuff on me man don't worry about it you got better style well, i think so that's don't... why we make such a great team like we we Compliment we both have highs well. and lows and they level each other out um, but just Shelly Shell, if I'm saying that correctly, said, I can't find the comment, but I remember saying something about, oh, I wish you guys had a podcast. Well, guess what? <laughs> I do have a podcast. Now, it is not always, um, well, actually, I can even say always, it is not necessarily BPD related, but it's an amazing community that we every week i have a new guest on that they share their story and provide the resources of what they've done to overcome share my story in it um part of what we do in these little like lives like off of the morning lives is we give little teasers uh Kevin and I do have some ideas of something really cool that goes into AJ's question of have I, um, right. We, we have something cool in the works that we're in discussing yeah. with that. Um, no promises with anything because w this is not about me. It's about us helping people, but we have fun ideas and we also have some upcoming podcast fun ideas too that are more BPD related, but it would make my heart so happy if you checked out the show regardless. It's um, in my link tree, by the way, you guys, if you just click on my profile and you should probably go ahead and follow David too. He puts out good information about the podcast. So um, you can check out his profile and see what it's all about. Yeah. And Surviving Podcast or David Keck is a simple Google, and I'm yep. on all the things and find. Miss um, Liss also asked when we're talking 
backtracking a little bit about uh, contracts. And she said, David, do you utilize contracts with your clients now? I do not. Um, I have never done one with a uh, coaching client. I started getting traction and, and higher profile people were coming on and I was still new. It, like I woke up one day and it was like, oh, people like your podcast. I was like, oh, damn. Mm-hmm. You know, like I didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh. So um, I was trying to see what and I was getting into the more of a, like a business mindset of things which isn't always negative, but there's that equal level ground. Right. And so I I started doing this questionnaire and I tried to make it fun. You know, like, what are your, what are your favorite colors? So I can put that into your promos and, and things like that. But, but it ended up seeming joining my podcast just to be heard and to be seen became a task and a homework assignment. Right. And that's not what my, pl- my platform is. And so I quickly did away with that. But as far as a lesson that I learned with that, Miss Liss, is going into coaching, I have not done contracts. I just I believe people. And you do right by me, I'll do right by you, and all the great things, um, which is where I'm at right now. Um, Organic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very important to me. Uh, Laura said, I'm so much like David. I've been writing down questions to ask Kevin all week. And listen, I try to come into this as if I know things and as if I'm the next Barbara Walters. But a lot of the questions I ask Kevin is because I just want to know the freaking knowledge. I'm like, teach me. <laughs> hmm. That's that's very nice. Without you yeah. knowing that I appreciate I'm it. asking you for it because I don't want your head. <laughs> well, yeah. I have a whole lot to say about almost everything. My phone records but, um, confirm that is a true statement. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it takes it takes forever to get me off the phone. You know, we have a business meeting. I'll tell you that because I got a lot a lot of plans for our community. A lot of great things to talk about. I want to give, and then I will shut up and let you take over, but I want to shout out to um, AJ and Laura and Miss Les because, you know, we had mentioned in the beginning, and some people probably didn't hear, but we want to focus on on the questions in the beginning of, of you and I and right. not really being able to pay attention to um, the questions coming in from the listeners. But my gosh, you guys, you all have made sure everyone is seen and heard and jumped on that and that's that's what i love about this community um so i just wanted to give a shout out to you all for yeah they do a great job man i mean honestly i don't don't think we could have you know started growing as as we have especially in the morning shows it it gets chaotic i see them contribute a lot they pick up a lot of the questions they already know the answers to. They've been coming every day. I mean, how, how can you not? You hear the same kinds of themes sometimes. You start to pick up on that. It changes your life, though. So, you know, for, for those people who are new here, we're very action-based, David and I. Uh, we're not therapists. It's not like that. Uh, we are coaches. The things we do are shared experiences. When I have a client, I share experiences, they share experiences, and that part's important because you have to understand that I, I know where you're coming from in order to believe me when I say that I know where you're going. You know, that's, that's the important part. And sometimes getting the things, you know, while we're on the topic of trauma too, I had something that I wanted to say earlier, it just came back to me. You know, the, I, I always have the initial struggle in the beginning um, where somebody's like, okay, yeah, I, I, I believe I, I want in the program. I'm working with them now, right? That first jump, that first, where I'm telling them, look, it feels uncomfortable. You're not going to like it. It's a little unknown, but if you do it, you're going to, you're going to be glad you did. There's a reward on the other side and all the fear that you have around that um, is ridiculous. And you'll see that soon. Uh, the reason we have such a hard time making that that jump 
is because of the initial trauma that makes us very skeptical of the world, very distrusting. Did you know, David, that uh, you might have heard me say it before, but BPD people are scientifically proven to be distrusting, more distrusting of other people. Now, that's uh, that's non-discriminating. I mean, that, that includes your coach, your therapist, your doctors. We don't trust as easy as neurotypical people. That is because we started out as victims due to the trauma. Why would I trust the world? If you saw what happened to me when I was six, you wouldn't trust anybody either. Makes total sense. Now you couple that with the second part of this problem, which is the fact that most of the time, um, treatment models, therapy, these DBT, CBT, all this stuff, working. So we start building up a repeated failure syndrome where we are seeing failure after failure after failure trying to get better and not being able to obtain it. Hello, Cleo, I see you in there. Um, and this makes us expect failure. It makes us um, more sheltered. It makes us less ambitious in changes. So when I'm trying to get them to make that first hurdle, they're like, well, look, you're my 17th mental health professional. What are you gonna do different? You know what I mean? Why should I trust you? I've already tried all these things, it didn't work right? Well, once I do get them to make that first jump, it's pretty much a snowball effect from there because they get rewarded. Well, I didn't want to do this. He was right. I didn't want to do it. And he said that. He told me it'd be uncomfortable. He said that's going to be probably exactly the opposite of what I want to do. But ironically, I'm getting everything I want out of it when I do this thing. And then they're willing to make the next jump and the next jump. And now we can sprint across that rickety bridge instead of. And, and that that's kind of the system that I use. Um, I love that. It works very well. A question that just popped up. And I'm not sure if there's context above that I haven't seen. So forgive me um, if there is, but it's. Zen for Jen says, but is it therapy? Mm -hmm. And and um, Laura is correct. It is coaching. We are not mandated reporters, so it allows our clients to tell us everything with no risk because we're not here. Um, we're not here to punish you for being honest or for being open or for reaching out with your hand another person for help that's that's not a punishable offense in my book and and i hate that i couldn't get that help when i was trying to get better it took me 12 years to beat this i saw over 16 different mental health professionals many more really but i can crop you know catalog i have a evidence of 16 that i remember for sure you know what i mean and every single one of them i i found reason at the door uh, and that is part of the problem. I remember being hysterical in a hospital one night and there, there are doctors and nurses coming in and I had the same thing to say to all of them. You don't even care. Why are you even here? Why are you here? They thought I was rude, but in reality, like, I hate to say this part. People do care, but they care minimally. They care just enough not to care. you know, they care about the liability. They care about getting sued. They care about, um what they're eating for dinner at the end of the night. They're not suffering like we are around the clock. That's the truth. And even if they did care, even if you found a doctor who really was sincere and, and they really did care, they're still not going to be there all day. We are. Our coaching program has worked as instrumental in getting people to remission. I have to be there. I have to care. I set my alarm halfway through the night and I check my messages. Ask any of my clients. Generally speaking, my response time is one to three hours, man. For real. Always been that way. And I'm doing sessions around the clock. I have a dissertation I'm writing. I talk business meetings a day. <laughs> <laughs> I am a busy dude. And somehow I still find time for you. I still find time to see you when you need me. And when I get those text messages, I know what's happening. I know everything there is to know about this condition because I lived in it. So sometimes I'll see, oh, you know, 
He just gave me a one word response. That's abnormal. And I know instantaneously where is my fucking and you have to tell me everything at that point because I I can dive in there and provide the information necessary to work through this problem. It's camaraderie. Camaraderie makes it easier to get over the trauma, to brainstorm, to problem solve, to come up with real world solutions and actual action that makes an impact on your life. Unlike therapy, where the first person talking about what happened since the last time you saw him, I know what's happening because we're talking every day. I often become friends with the people that I coach because how the hell can you not, first off? I'm all up in your life every day. You're all up in mine. You're picking my brain, asking me all sorts of personal questions. Before you know it, you know everything about me. I end up knowing everything about you. I end up liking you because you want to know a secret. That's it. I just climbed this one ladder slightly faster than you. And I'm able to help you climb too. After people get to remission, they're giving me all sorts of different pieces of advice, man. That's the truth of it. So because we're all incredible people. Something happened to us. Something happened to us. And it's much like we were just a bird in the wind, not knowing what pressure we're doing, but smacked right out of the sky. That's what it feels like when we're trying to learn how to fly again. So that's what I offer. That's what David offers. That's what we do. We help you fly again. Whatever direction you go is your choice. If you want to fly south like all the other birds, you could do that, or you could just be a bird in the wind like I described. And, you know, maybe you get smacked. It's like you said, David, trauma doesn't discriminate. It can happen any place, anytime, anywhere to anyone. And I would like to preface this with um, please allow grace because I am very passionate about this. And so I get on tangents and in my head, I think it makes sense. And at some point y'all are probably gonna be like, David, no one knows what you're saying. And that's fine. I will respect that. However, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, Going down David's I am version of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm self-aware, but I think what happens when um, someone said, but is that therapy? I think what happens a lot of times is we take this word such as therapy and we put this definition to it, right? When therapy is very broad, you know, the, 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 the cliches of retail therapy, self-care, like those are all part of therapy, right? Like sure. it's not that you have to go into an office and sign a sign and she can give your insurance card and then go into a room and then set a timer that's to tell me what you want to tell me. And then I'm going to prescribe you something like that absolutely can be a form of therapy. And I've been there not knocking it. Yeah. But, but what, what, what I task people to think about and do is what is therapy to you? When I put my headset in and I take to, and can out, called me and I've hit ignore and I'm, I said dude you're calling me here in a, a, the middle of a Reba song no 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 this is my <laughs> time you know what I mean like like I have the that is my therapy you know that being said Kevin and I will get on the phone sometimes and we'll say hey business cap and we talk business and oh, this is not business you're my friend right now that's therapy Right. You know, sometimes me going to the mall and buying a new shirt is therapy. So, so what I task people to think about when they think about the word therapy is what is that word to you? The way that I look at I had a life coach a few years ago, which is kind of what inspired me in my journey. That was part of my self care you know, which is part of my therapy. And it's also part of me having that control of I'm being proactive and driving this car. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to throw those things out there. Um, I, no, I like that. I like that a lot, actually, because everybody's, it, it highlights an important part of this journey too, which is just because we all have BPD or trauma or whatever it may be, 
it still doesn't make us completely identical. I, I mean, it's not like, and, and that's the different, that's another big difference between what we do and um, what I see a lot of, you know, I, all the DVT programs I did, they were very non-personal to me, even though, you know, yeah. they try to personalize it. It just, I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel known. I didn't feel understood. Um, but this process, we learn as we go, just as you are learning as you go. We're learning about you. And that's how we know what to focus on. That's how we know what it, it custom. It's personalized. It's it's important that is custom tailored. You know the sessions that are coming with our packages. Those aren't so we can chat. You know those aren't so that you can tell us how you feel. I should already know how you feel from the daily texting. Those are for you yeah. to literally listen to me talk your ear off for an hour. Dave a different job. I'm sure that you do more talking when you talk to him than you do with me. But those of you who work with me, I'm running my mouth nonstop because the more that I speak in that hour, the more you walk away with. And most clients are completely fine with this. I'll pause halfway, not halfway, like four times or so. I'll pause and I'll say, "Hey, how are we doing? Are you are you getting all this? almost always the same?" Yes. Keep going. Because when you truly understand someone, when you truly see them, you know them. And I was them. So it's very easy for me to see exactly where somebody is and help them see the bigger picture. All the perspective and zoom out a little bit. And then it all becomes very clear. And at that point, you regain control. And they'll yeah. naturally tell me what's bothering them the most, by the way, and naturally lead to the trauma because, you know, hey, this is the pressing issue. And I'll go into it with them to figure out what the real issue is and we'll go d deep, whatever, right? Once you resolve that, then it's a pressing issue. Because there's a lot of pressing issues, just there's always going to be one in the front. So yeah. that's kind of, you know, and then I end up sending to you sometimes when I realize I've hit certain hurdles that I know you can resolve faster, more efficiently than I can. Sure. Um, makes us a great team. That's for sure. Two different perspectives. Yeah, 100%. One, um, one solution though, you know? There was a mission. question that came in and I want to find it because I think it's very important. But as I'm finding it, I want to say you had mentioned that you'll stop at least four times in a meeting um, or, or, you know, whatever. Um, and mm -hmm. and check in. Could you start? In, I mean, could you four times just check in? So maybe I can talk sometimes. To... Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> just kidding. I just I just wanted to laugh. It's a, little it's bit a nonstop on running joke in my life. <laughs> Literally, it's a theme. You know, uh, I'm just totally kidding. Um, but just Shelly Shell, and I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, let me know if I'm not. But I feel like now. Morning, we've conversed through the live, and now you're in this chat. So I feel like we're at a place where I can just call you Shell, unless that's wrong, and correct me. But her question <laughs> is, <laughs> her question is, have you continued to talk to your clients after your program is over? My quick answer to that, and then I will let Kevin answer, is there is not a single person that I've worked with that I don't call a friend now. Yeah, that's um, that's the case for me as well. I'm I'm heavily invested when I take a when I take a case. Um, I am very heavily invested. I, how can you not be? Like I said, most intimate personal details. Clients feel so close to me. They're telling me their grievances. They're telling me exactly what's on their mind. They're telling me the past. They're telling me the future they want. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing though. You end up learning who I am in the process. That, that's part of this. As I said before, camaraderie is so important. Camaraderie has the ability to person in AA and cure them of alcoholism as long as they keep using the camaraderie in that case. I think that a lot of times, you know, I've, I've done AA. I used to struggle from tons of substance abuse problems, tons of alcohol problems to cope with my trauma. I was hiding from the answers. So I thought, okay, I'll go to AA and it works as long as 
that's the power of camaraderie. It's able to be alcoholism right now. I still think that people in AA probably need more skills than just the 16 step set system. The guy that invented that, you know, not to knock the program or anything, but the last thing he said on his deathbed was give me the whiskey, you know? And he just, he just got the whiskey because it's, it's tough beating it. Skills, perspective changes, validation, a purpose in life, a reason to live. You have to change the regions in the brain that are deficit. If you don't, then all you have is camaraderie. And that's not enough to be fully cured of, some, of anything, really, in my opinion. Um, having a relationship is camaraderie, and that doesn't solve all your problems. That's all right there. You can have a perfect relationship and have a whole bunch of other issues in your life that cannot be resolved by that union. Because it's, it's not enough, but it sure is helpful. And it's also worth noting that, you know, at the end of the day, when you really are 80 years old, you're looking back, it wasn't the journey necessarily. It wasn't where we started. It was the company along the way. Okay. So you surround yourself with people that are good people that you want to be around. And every single person that I get better or help contribute to their recovery, they're incredible people that I want to be around. <laughs> you know, it's basically cool inside. Just um, this has weighed us down. So this has to be changed, you know, the weight. But other than that, I mean, there's a friend in every single person here right now. Kevin, we are getting close to the hour mark. Oh, yes, um, we are. I didn't even notice. That. If we have to go over a few minutes, I'm fine with that. But there's something that just came through that I definitely want to talk about, like, this is why, and I can only speak for me, I feel like Kevin feels the same way, but these are the comments of why I wake up and do what I do every day. The, these are the things that motivate me. These are the things that sometimes run on. If anyone has been on our lives before and knows anything about me, post it's galore. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, these you're are really the good at that... you're really good at keeping up with it all. It is the truth. I can even just shout it out during the live and then you're like, by the way, <laughs> and it comes perfectly timed when I have downtime, you're like, you remember that thing that you said in the live, like forty five minutes and I'm like, that's right. <laughs> but but I, I want to be I want to thank you, sir. But I want to be very transparent and also ask for forgiveness if need be. But Zen for Jen, tonight is the, I think, the only night that I've seen your name. And if you have been in my comments and, and I'm just not recognizing your name, please forgive that. But the, the comment she just made that I, I would love for both of us to react sure. to is, I didn't think BPD went into remission. I'm 54, diagnosed two years ago. You make a lot of sense. Hmm. What I will say and give you the floor is these comments make me so happy. Someone like we're we're a part of showing that there's hope and that there's community and and damn it, things can freaking happen. So mm -hmm. Zen for Jen. Thank you for, thank you for being here. Tune in all the time. <laughs> Email us. Yeah. Do other things. I will let you respond to that now. <laughs> well, Jen, um, I'll tell you, the oldest client that I've had is 84 years old. I can't imagine living with this uh, all the way to 80. And that breaks my heart. It totally breaks my heart. We start out in life as victims, but I, I, I want you to leave here today with something very special, which is that the stigma behind this condition, and I understand why it happens. It's happened this way um, because we never learned any other way to behave, any other way to respond, any other way to, to um, formulate a life. We got, we got victims stamped right on our forehead almost immediately. And, and that's how we have been forced to live. But everybody looks at us and says, why are you behaving that way? 
but it's very clear to me why we behave that way. Who wouldn't? The truth is, it's for power. I say it all the time. Batman's parents died. That's why he's Batman. You know? And, and we are insanely capable, insanely intelligent, um, super loving, super passionate, super empathetic, problem solving, ambitious, hardworking, tenacious individuals. Every single one of us. I work with a ton of people who have this condition. We all have those traits in common. A lot of people are scared to get better. That is a reservation. They're afraid they're going to lose themselves. They're afraid they're going to lose their personality. They're afraid they're going to lose their friends. They're afraid they're going to be boring. They're afraid uh, they'll be zombies, right? Okay, I got to hold on one second here. It tries to end the live on me for whatever reason. Anyway, so I think it's because I hadn't touched the screen in a while. But the, the point I'm making here is you can get rid of all of the negative parts of this at any age, at any time, the day that you decide. You have to commit to it, and you need the roadmap of which we are really trying out there. Um, I know that we're over the live. I'm going to end with this one statement, and then I'll pass it to you, David, and you can um, call it a night for us. I, I want Jen to understand this important part. Hopefully you're still in here, Jen. There are five things that you need to get to remission, and it is that simple. The first is awareness, of which you have to be clear. You have to admit you have this condition. You have to admit to what extent it has impacted your life in the past and the present. That includes things like your relationship. Number two, motivation. If you don't have motivation, you will not have the persistence to see it through. This could be anything. It could be that you don't want your kids to have to live with this. Some people don't want to develop it. For some people, their kids already have. That's okay. I work with kids of all types of ages as well. Okay, And they're very malleable. The younger they are, the more the fluid intellect, the faster they can change with the right guidance and set of eyes, okay? So it's never too late there. But maybe that's your motivation. Maybe it's that you don't want your partner to suffer alongside you. Maybe it's that you want to you just maybe you want to reclaim your future because right now BPD owns it just as it has the past, okay? So motivation. Three, a will to change. Because nothing changes if nothing changes, man. Can't keep going down the same road every single day doing the same thing every single day. You've got to do something different. And if you do the right different things, if you start doing the things that people in remission do, of which I'm happy to guide you through, you would be surprised the reward. I know it's scary, but remember, the best things in life are on the other side of terror. 100% true. Now, the last two things I bring to the table, making sure that my clients have the first three before we start. Otherwise, it won't work. You need to get those three under control. But you come to me, tell me your story, you know, write me an email. My email's in my profile. Tell me your full story. I take the time to thoroughly read everything. I take the time to think and I respond fully, okay? I'll know what to ask you. The last two things, the skills and perspective changes that are necessary to cope with actual life. You need to be able to get ahead of the triggers. You need to be able to beat the symptoms. You need to get out of and, and divert from episodes and splits. And then finally, the most important thing of all, and also the easiest yet the hardest thing to obtain, but I'm self-validation. You have to be able to feel comfortable in your own skin you have to believe that you're valuable, of which we all are. You are a superhero. You just don't realize it yet. And it's never too late. I mean, Ian McKellar didn't get famous until he was like 65 years old, man. Now he's like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. Like, the guy's ridiculously famous. Sometimes it just happens that way. It's the universe, it's just how it is but you don't know yet your full potential or who you will become or what you will accomplish. When you get to remission, it's almost like a butterfly flaps its wings over here. And then all of a sudden a giant monstrous hotel appears in Japan. I don't know what impact you're gonna have in the world, but I know each and every one of us 
makes a dent in the universe when we get to remission. So that's all I'll say here. I'll let you um, tie it up, David. I, I really appreciated all the questions and you, um, you know, putting yourself out there too every day, all the time. So some credit should be given to you. And before, because I know you're not going to say this, um, follow David, walk, look at his profile, check out his podcast. There's a link in his profile. There's a link in my profile. Um, it's surviving based on trauma featuring one new trauma survivor every week. Super fun show. Well, you know, super, super fun show. You know what I mean? <laughs> How much can you save up trauma and fun? They go hand in hand to some extent if you're learning. So now you, it's all yours, David. Thanks for bearing with my mouth. Going forward, I think that I should start to closing first because I always want to end on your motivational stuff. Like it's so amazing. It's your turn. And, 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 and I wish I was one of those people that could just say, I bow out gracefully and let this end, but I'm not. So I've got things to say. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just kidding. But what, what I love is when I start every phone call with each other is what I'm referring to it with a laugh. And we end a phone call with a laugh. And and that's something that I've always done with my podcast. Like people hear the word surviving and you talk about trauma and they want to say, oh, I can't listen. I don't want to be depressed. Like I get the high from it. Like I literally had to base my recordings on my sleep schedule because I was finding that I was recording before bedtime, but then I had just this natural high after the conversation that I couldn't go to bed. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for all the inspirational stuff that you say, especially in the end, like it's such a good way to or our day, mm -hmm. you know, in right. the mornings or, or into that night. My little flair to that, and I want to say there's 36 new messages that we haven't got to guys. No one is unheard or unseen. If we didn't get up, if we didn't get it, please DM us, message us, send it to one of the moderators. Reach out for sure. Yeah. Reach out. But what I'm going to end on uh, from Kevin's motivational, I'm going to end on something kind of funny because that's what I like is just a good laugh. And so um, I have made the comment of just Shelly Shell. I was like, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I think at this point we're great friends. And she responded, you're pronouncing it, cor it correctly. Shell is just fine. And thank you with some cute hearts. <laughs> and so now that we have a friend, welcome. And Shell, I expect to see you any and every time that you can join the live. And I'm so excited to learn more about you. And Thank you, everybody. Kevin, will you tell everybody when we do our lives of where they can find us to close out? Sure will. So the BPD Live Sensitive Stability Show is Monday, Friday, 7 a.m. U.S. EST, uh, where we talk about BPD, trauma, and similar topics. Everybody who shows up has a positive attitude about it, generally speaking, and uh, positivity is contagious, as someone mentioned in the comments, guys. So if you're looking for a place to be, a place to better yourself, or a place to um, even inspire yourself, this is a place to be, and we'd love to see you in the morning live tomorrow at 7 a.m. So thank you for tuning in tonight and have a good night, guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow, David. Bye-bye.